Hi, everyone. Um, we're in Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's a shameful thing even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray together. Come, Lord God, creating God, the God who by your word made all things. Come and by your word remake us. Send your spirit to us that we can hear you. Send your spirit that our lives respond to you. We need you, Lord, and we pray that you would help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so these things that Paul holds out in Ephesians to these people in Ephesus and to us, I reckon these are things that we want, aren't they? We want to live in the light. Uh, we want to live wisely. We don't want to be asleep. We want to be awake. We want to redeem the time to make the most of all the time that we had to make the most of every opportunity. We want those things. We want to discern what the Lord's will is. Don't we want these things? These are, this is talking to us. We want these things. And even if you're in church today and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, you're probably here because you want to explore these things. You want to live wisely. We want to make the most of these lives that we have. This morning, we're going to explore this. In, in a kind of different way than, than I might normally explore it, because I'm compelled to explore it through one particular activity that I think enables wise living, that enables us to redeem the time, that enables us to discern what the Lord's will is. And that activity is singing. You are right to laugh, because I am not a singer. Uh, one of the reasons I like a handheld mic is just in case the mic that goes over my ear is ever switched on during the songs, because you don't want to hear that. I've never been in a worship band. I've, I've, never, I've never been a singer. I'm, I'm like a congregational singer. I, I like singing. People around me don't really like my singing. But here's the thing, right? I am absolutely convinced that singing is an essential part of the Christian life for nearly all of us. I'm really, really convinced that singing isn't just a, like a sideline activity, but singing is where it happens. Singing the praise of God is, I think, the soundtrack to our lives as Christians. Now, we know soundtracks. I love a good soundtrack for a film. Uh, we know soundtracks make the film. And they make the film not just because they're like the wallpaper, but because a great soundtrack. Do you know the great soundtrack can kind of 
uh, enable you to connect with what's going on. It helps you feel the emotion of what's happening. It can change moods, it can illustrate, but also it can embody things and enable what is happening. Let's have some fun then. So I've got eight soundtracks for you. I want to know who the first person is who can guess what the soundtrack is. There are eight of these. We'll go quickly. It is The Lion King. Second one. Yeah. Toy Story, which are obviously Toy Story 2 is the best of the four. Yeah, the dancing at the back does it for me. Thank you very much. That is uh, the tragic Mamma Mia. Oh, okay. All right, here we go. We're getting edgy. Yeah, it is train spotting. Such a shame you got it so quickly. It's the best of all the tracks that are there. Right, here we go. Classic. It is the sound of music. Who got that? Oh, the bat got, they got the sound of music. Uh, no, next. Here's, look, here the front row here are getting them all. Uh, La La Land, which is an incredibly great film. Uh, well, let's have no deba debating that. La La Land is a great film. Uh, this one. I'm going this side. I'm looking this side because this side are winning. It is Romeo and Juliet. Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. And lastly, sorry everyone. No, like, honestly, parents are like, no, not here. Please, this, please let this be a frozen free zone. Right, so soundtracks. We know soundtracks. Soundtracks make films, make us sing along, and make us enter the story. My argument is that praise is the soundtrack for our lives as Christians. Not just one song, but lots of different songs. But these songs, I think we should really cultivate as like the way that are the things that accompany us as we try and live wisely, as we try to redeem the time. Singing has always been a, an essential part, I think, of the Christian faith. Literally, it is central to the Bible. Singing is central to the Bible. Psalm, 150 Psalms in the center of the Bible. And singing and music is all the way throughout Scripture. Genesis chapter 4. At Genesis chapter 4, we've got Jubal, who is the father of all stringed instruments, already in Genesis chapter 4. Singing is mentioned 292 times in Scripture, 68 times in the Psalms, which literally mean songs. When they get through the Red Sea, Miriam takes up a tambourine and Moses leads the singing. Nehemiah sings, the trees of the field clap their hands. The stars, the morning stars in Job 38, we're told, are singing as creation is brought into being. Angels sing. Kings sing. Prophets sing. Mary sings when she is pregnant with Jesus. Angels sing. When the people are taken into Babylon, the captors say to them in Psalm 137, sing us the songs of Zion. How do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land. How do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? This is something that we work out the whole time because praise is the soundtrack for our lives. But why do we sing? In Ephesians chapter 5, I think there's a massive connection that Paul makes here where he says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the heart. Paul pivots, you see, like from being drunk to being filled with the Spirit. Don't, don't do that. Don't be filled with that kind of Spirit. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know Acts chapter 2, you know, the first people who witnessed Pentecost thought that what was going on among the Christians was that they were drunk. But they stood up saying, I'm not drunk, as you think. That's why bishops wear amethysts on their bishops' rings, because an amethyst in Greek means I'm not drunk. True. 
That's why they had the flame on their head. That's those silly hats. It's about the spirit because the feel, being filled with the spirit, like sometimes people thought it was drunkenness, but it's the opposite of that. Now, is it that Paul thinking about drunkenness thinks, oh, hold on, people sing when they're drunk. Let's talk about singing. I don't think it's just that. I think there is something that goes on about us being filled with the spirit as we sing. And the verbs that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 5 of being filled with the Spirit are present verses. He wants you to keep being filled with the Spirit. It's not a past tense. It's a present continuous. Keep being filled with the Spirit. Okay, how do we do that? I think praise is essential for it. This is why. Think of a relationship that you, are, you have that is a critical relationship. Not critical good, but critical in terms of it's a di disapproving relationship on you. Where it feels like the person is only going to pick you up on things that they think should be different about you. That every, it feels like everything you do is wrong. Now, what do these relationships do to us? Well, one, we try to avoid them, understandably. But two, what they do is they make us close down, don't they? They make us withdraw. They make us kind of retract ourselves. Right, think of the opposite of that. Think about a relationship, which is a, a relationship where you're praised. Not flattered. We don't believe flattery. Because people who flatter us, just like for what they can get out of us, we know that they've just got something in it, and we don't really believe flattery. Those silver-tongued types. Don't believe flattery. But what we do believe is people who state things that are true about us, that, that are praising us. Now, what happens in those relationships? Well, in those relationships, don't we become more ourselves? Don't like our shoulders go back and we go, look, I can be myself in this. Don't we expand into that space and become even more ourselves? Is this making sense? Okay, so praising relationships. We know we, we're, we're made to be part of praising relationships amongst each other. Now, let's, let's think about God's presence. Right, there, I'm, I believe God is present everywhere. There are some places, a, a friend of mine has came back four, week, four months ago from Gaza and said it's almost utterly God forsaken. And yet he believes it's not utterly God forsaken because even in the midst of it all, God is present. I would say that God is present to his world all over, all, all the time. However, how do we explain those moments where it feels like there's a concentration of God's presence? Do you know what I mean? It feels So I argue that there are different types of God's presence. There's different concentration of God's presence. And God's relational, so those are always about our relationship to God. Okay, stick with me on this one. So we're all here, right? We're present to one another. So, so we're all in the same space. But if afterwards you have a conversation with somebody face to face... And you have a conversation which isn't just kind of passing the time of day, but which is that person starts to tell you the truth of who you are in a praising relationship. You are present with them, aren't you, in a completely different way than you are in a room with other 200 other people. Praise, when we praise God, when we declare who God is, the truth of God, his goodness, his love, his kindness, when we attend to God, when we give God our concentration and praise him for the truth of who he is, I believe what we do is we open up space for God to meet us and encounter us as ever more present. You see, I think that this is what singing does. Singing and singing, we attend to God, we declare the truth of who God is, and we open together, we open up space for God to be particularly present to us because praise is a dynamic form of communication. And it has always, always been part of the life of the people of God. This is why it makes us who we are because we are people of God's presence. God is present to us. And where is God particularly present to us? 
God is present to us when we praise. This is, God is still free. This is no genie in the lamp, kind of just rub the, them the lamp and it all just happens. God's free. But what we know is God is a relational God who fills the space that we open up when we praise. And so Paul urges us together to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs in the Spirit. Because praise shapes us together in God's presence. So I'm arguing then for a really critical place, a strong place for praise in the life of every Christian community. There's a corporate element, isn't there, to singing. It's something we do together. Uh, we do it together not just because like, it's better for you not just to hear me singing on my own. But we do it together because our faith is corporate. Of course it's intensely personal. Of course each one of us is called to live before God. But there's also something that's hugely corporate, always has been, about Christian faith. This is our faith. This is our God. And so as we sing together, you see, I think what happens is every person raises their voice. Every person's voice is necessary for us in order to together encounter God. We, we can't just rely on the people singing through the microphones. This isn't a spectator sport. We've not come to a gig. We've come to participate in encountering God. And every person's voice is vital in this. Because we know this, don't we? Something goes on when people sing together. You know, whether you're on football terraces or at a gig or um, a, a club or something like that. We know that something goes on as people sing together. Now, this is a vital part of singing. Thomas Aquinas, who's a great father of the church, like 800 years ago, says that there are three different directions for our praise. One is, we sing to one another. We encourage one another. Psalm 95, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us cry out with joy to the rock of our salvation. Loads of Christian singing is, is singing to one another. Come on, let's do this. The second type is we sing to ourselves. Psalm 57, awake my soul. 10,000 reasons. Bless the Lord, O my soul. We sing to ourselves. Thirdly, we sing to God. We sing directly to God, addressing God. Psalm 138, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. And we do this together because together we practice our faith and together we encounter God. This is how we inhabit faith. We inhabit it by believing, by declaring it, by entering into it, by comprehending it, by remembering it, by learning it, by stating it, by loving it, by realizing it, by holding on to it, by holding it out for one another. Haven't all of us been somewhere where we needed hope at certain points and hearing the singing of other people, it held out hope to us? Of course, today, as every week, we come from vastly different circumstances. Some people, you come in singing. You've got a song in your heart. You've had a great week. You might have got that job that you've been after. It might be fine with your bank account. Your prayers might be being answered. You, 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 can, you come and you think you've got every reason to praise the Lord. Other people, it's as much as you could do to get here this morning. In fact, you wondered whether you had the strength to. Because it's, it's hard. It's grim at the moment. There are circumstances that make you doubt. And you're not sure, quite sure what to make of it all. And so what do we do when we sing? Well, we raise our voices for one another. So if you can't sing today, l let us sing for you. Let us raise our voices for one another in praise. I will always encourage us to every person to lift their voice, however tentative. But we sing for one another. If I'm really struggling and my voice is weak and faltering, then you, you sing for me. And when I feel strong, I'll sing for you. Do you see, singing is this corporate activity that we do together. Psalms, hymns, songs in the spirit. 
What do you do when you can't find the words? Don't, don't stay away. Don't stay away from church when you can't find the words. Come. Come and hear you'll hear people singing for you. Lifting your voice isn't just for you. I happen to believe that this is for many people the way into faith. Uh, that many people are coming into faith because they, they need to come and join in these Christian practices. Even though they've still got some things that they're working through and they're wondering about the reason and the logic of it all, but they come in and they, they come and join in the praying and they come and join in the singing and they're going to come and join in the listening to scripture. I, I don't think so much people come to faith through kind of rationality, but we come through practices and habits and experiences and through relationships. If that's you today, if you're just like on the edges of faith, Come in and make these songs your own. In our singing together, then, we celebrate this relationship of being God's people together. It's corporate, but it's also deeply personal. So Paul goes on to say, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. This is my idea of let the praise of God be the soundtrack for your life in everything. This isn't just escapist. This isn't some kind of put your fingers in your ears and blank yourself out to the suffering and pain in the world that makes singing praise difficult. So having praise and singing as a soundtrack for your life isn't like this is te this terrible stuff falling about in all the world and we've just kind of filling our ears with something that blots us out to the pain of the world. Of course not. Have you read the Psalms? Over a third of them, Psalms of Lament. No, 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 this isn't what's going on. Because the praise is the soundtrack for our lives. We don't ignore what's going on. Starkest of those psalms, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a song that is a soundtrack for one life in particular. For Jesus' life. What book? Does Jesus quote from, from the Old Testament more than any other book? The book of Psalms. Why might he be quoting the book of Psalms? Could it be that he himself has sung these songs, these, these hymns of praise, and they've become his soundtrack for his life? And so when he is hanging on a cross, feeling utterly abandoned, he cries out, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so for us, this praise, this singing is a discipline. It's a choice. It's a decision to sing. It's an act of faith which enables us to live our lives with God. The other day, I was amazed when my children put on Bolly Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart. I was amazed because they claimed it was a banger. I was even more amazed that I knew all the words. Like, when did I ever learn the words to total eclipse of the heart? Like, I can't remember the fourth to go down to Sainsbury's to buy. How did that get in my system? It got in my system because it's words to a tune, it's a song. And so it becomes part, somehow, of our imagination. Singing gets into our system. There's an ancient phrase that theologians use, which is lex orande, lex credende. You never need to remember that, but it just basically means what you sing is what you believe. What you sing is what you believe. This is why singing is so vital for us as Christians. Because we're not just saying the things that we know and believe in those moments. We're saying these things that Christians like us have believed and built their life on throughout the centuries. So personal praise. There will be songs that are, you know that are the soundtrack for your life. Sometimes we can share those songs. We can share the gold that we find around. But I would really encourage you to personally lean in on singing and praise yourself. In a moment, we're going to do exactly this. This is why we've saved moments of worship till after the sermon. So we can practice this. So we can do this. So we can ourselves lift our songs in praise to God and encounter God to be ever more present to us. 
And so, band, I'm going to need you up here in a moment. We're going to give thanks to God. We're going to praise him. We're going to love him. And, of course, all this is a response. All this is because of who God is and what God has done for us. And as we do this, we do this for God. We do this for the world, and we do this for one another. We join Christians throughout the ages who have sung praise to God as the soundtrack for their life. We join in with saints throughout the centuries. We join in with angels constantly, constantly praising in heaven. We anticipate the singing of heaven, angels cascading song after song after song. And you probably have heard Zephaniah chapter 3 as a beautiful scripture. Do not fear, the Lord your God is with you. He delights in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. We are doing more than just joining in with the praise of the centuries. We're doing more than just joining in with praise around the world. This, friends, is a divine song put in our hearts by the great singer, the Lord who loves us and who made us. The last activity Jesus does with his disciples before he goes to Gethsemane is sing. He sings a hymn with his followers. Singing the song of redemption and salvation. Singing, friends, isn't just a human thing. It's a divine thing. Lord, open our lips. Please stand if you're able and let's praise him.